So I'm Jesse Jacobson. I'm a principal at Games That Work, which is a serious game studio here in Atlanta. Um, we've done some work with augmented reality, teaching children to brush their teeth uh, actually intraorally, so that's really with a toothbrush. And we've done some VR projects that um, have won some awards at the uh, EdTech, uh, I don't know the name of it anymore, but the uh, Department of Education put on uh, a couple of educational VR uh, contests that we've done very well in. Wasn't your CIA project VR? Our CIA project was not VR. Oh, Our CIA project was actually web-based um, oh. and led to the only time I've ever successfully um, used the fact that we control the web server to, uh, wait, no, um, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify, when you say CIA. Te technic <laughs> technically, it was not the CIA. Technically, it was IARPA, which is a de which is the Intelligence Agency's Advanced Research Project Association. It's their version of DARPA. It's 17 intelligence communities that all work together to fund research, and um, the CIA is one of those partners. But it was through the Department of National Intelligence. By the way, putting you all on notice, you use an acronym. I'm going to ask you. Because <laughs> people deserve to know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ken Leitner. I'm a game developer of many decades. I'm not admitting to anything else. <laughs> um, <clears throat> recently switched over to serious games, but uh, I've worked on a couple of VR projects and uh, definitely have a lot of experience going through all the available VR games and what they take advantage of and what they don't. So I will go back down the line. I'm actually going to reserve moderator's privilege and go last um, to say, what are the three things that you think are worthwhile bringing up on this panel that you would want people to walk out of this room knowing today? Sure, absolutely. So uh, first of all, as a running the association, the goal is always to get more people making games as well as playing them. So something we have to keep in mind is that there are often developers who need tool help as well. And I'm always amazed at, for instance, the macros that some, to some developers who don't really have full physical capability will come up with to help them go through their own development process. So a lot of this applies over. Secondly, for developers, it's not a matter of being nice to people to incorporate uh, a wider range of interface capabilities it is to get a bigger audience and I we learned this very early that not taking into account color blindness for instance when you're picking your color palette for a game hurts you as a developer and implementing accessibility features doesn't just expand your audience but it makes for a better game and thinking about these things from the very beginning are what any good dev uh, should be doing. Third is that VR is starting to reach to a much broader spectrum of, of games we do. We're working with people who do interactive storytelling now, more less interactivity, more storytelling, but still some, and other games which have a great deal of interactivity along the way. And there is no one, um, there is no one, uh, solution for all of these but there are definitely best practices in place i'm actually going to do this you and then Evan, sure. and then okay. you two i do not know your names very well i cannot see your name tags i'm going to be Just very say bad k and this. j or j and k awesome <laughs> we've got a ken so we can have a barbie next to him jk jk <laughs> i'm going to be a little bit of a foil um one of the one of the things that concerns me is that VR, as we are uh, looking at it right now, definitely takes advantage of all of the fully able things. And one of the things that both the games that I worked on stressed on stressed was you know full body motion and like getting video gamers to actually get some exercise. So being able to dodge, d do having things going on that you need both hands for, and you need your head for. Those, those made the experiences more compelling. And as a developer, I wouldn't want to give those up because that, that will shrink my audience quicker than making it accessible. On the other hand, you know, as the ADA says, as he's got all the paperwork over there, I'll let him quote <laughs> it. But uh, you know, where reasonable concessions can be made, definitely they should be made. Um, having said that, um, a lot of VR is now going location based. So, like I work in serious games, we buy the, you know, I work for for basically 
Uh, the contractor chain is the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army, you know, makes a lot of handicapped people, but they don't employ a lot of <laughs> handicapped people. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it too much, but we're using high-end headsets, and, you know, there is the money there to, to make things accessible. If you were doing, like, an uh, amusement park ride, you're already spending probably ten grand on your VR s setup, uh, spending a little extra for accessibility, I think, is well within the ADA at this point. All right. Um, so top three things for me, uh, I'll save the assistive device for last. Um, one thing that uh, we're noticing a lot is that, uh, especially in the near future, especially with the AI, it's going to be rapidly advancing virtual reality, augmented reality we're going to be having the classes. It's going to be a norm to, to use. And there's going to be a big issue, especially with people with, with disabilities who can't use that as effectively, because we're going to be, be able to be way more productive. There's going to be more social settings. There's going to be almost a requirement in the future, I see, for us using augmented virtual reality to manipulate data and just perform much better. Um, and so, of course, that's what this panel's here for, um, to work on solutions that, that we can do. And so one of them, of course, is working on new assistive technologies. Uh, I, I find that a lot of uh, technologies out there, especially for quadriplegics um, and what have you, who use the sip and puff or the quad stick, those are very innovative, very great inventions. However, they are inventions of an older generation and with new technologies like AI and virtual reality, augmented reality, we need to give access to these people so that they can essentially be as productive or close to as productive as us, have their own jobs and do uh, many other things. And so one thing I do want to highlight is the, uh, at least with the technology that I'm working on, a lot of those technologies such as the sip and pup, the quad stick, or any technologies like the head array, those all conflict with virtual and augmented reality because it's using your head as a way to look around and interact. So you can't use a head array with that because then that would be conflicting with the already head array movement. And then the second thing would be the sip and puff or the quad stick. Those were all things that were designed in front of you to be looking at a static screen and not moving my head around and everything like that. So those are not possible. Possible. There's nothing that's compatible with virtual reality where if you know quadriplegic or what have you is like looking over there They're not gonna be able to interact with that thing because this is how they interact And so with this tongue drive which by the way in case you guys are wondering I have a little magnet here That's a little like rice grain sized tracer and that's all I need in my mouth I can talk normally I can drink water with it. I, I mean, I wouldn't suggest eating with it um, but uh, it's a very unique way of being able to move your head and interact with something at the same time. And this doesn't go just for people with wheelchairs, but also people who are missing limbs. They can add that extra hand if they're missing a hand. People in wheelchairs can control their wheelchair with their tongue while having both hands to use virtual and augmented reality. So that opens up a no whole new floor of, um, of ability to use it with. So I'm not going to go too much on that. but. That's just a, an example of, of what we can do with more assistive devices that are more compatible with virtual and augmented reality versus what we've been doing in the past for you know a screen in front of you. Um, another thing would be I, I really want to help educate people, um, especially with uh, what is known as the curb effect. And that's something that I would hope that a lot of developers would be considering when they're developing their games. And for those of you who don't know, the curb effect is a phenomenon where you build something that's for, that's for accessibility and then that then is greater appreciated by the whole general audience. So for instance, the curb effect comes from uh, the sidewalks. You have the curb that goes down. That wasn't invented for normal use. That was invented for wheelchairs specifically. But now we transition to the point where people don't even realize that and we're all using it because it's much easier and more efficient. So ideally we'll be able to find ways and use technologies and develop a better UI UX um, to, to essentially make it easier for people who have problems, but then it makes it easier for everyone else. Um, I think that was three. If not, I can keep talking. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking too much, uh, so I will I'll resign my time. <laughs> so I get to try to find the space that's left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, and I kind of want to use all, build off all th what three of you said, uh, except for Andrew, because I don't remember what he said anyway. <laughs> uh, so I think Ken's 100% correct that we are developing experiences that use more and more full body um, and more and more degrees of motion that are naturally attached to people. And I think what's great about that is we are, as we develop more and more of those skills, uh, and more and more of those sensors and, and inputs, um, we're going to get to the part where people who only can move their right hand or however it is that whatever mobility issues they have will have a full suite of controls that's designed around that. And then we can 
once we have the ability to sense that, we can then start driving input based on that. Um, and the, the fact that we want more fully body, uh, fully abled people to be able to have more fine control is going to, I think, drive a lot of assistive technologies that otherwise wouldn't happen. So I think VR is going to be great for pushing that forward across everyone. I think that it's going to be... Um, the second thing is it's going to, I think, help as especially people who have um, disabilities um, start developing games or people who are more aware or just have talked to people, we're going to have these experiences that let us actually be kind of more in their shoes. And I think that's there's a huge amount of sensitivity that can happen there where, you know, if, if my controls in the game are limited in the same way that someone else's controls in real life and in a non-virtual reality game are limited, I think I can develop a better appreciation, which sounds... It sounded like BS when I was told that at first, um, mm -hmm. but we've actually done some work, uh, a little bit of work with um, just, you know, in terms of we trying to make people better able to empathize with people in wheelchairs. Um, this was for, uh, um, I guess they were students of so elementary school, middle school students. And we put the main character in a wheelchair. We designed the gameplay around the exciting things you can do in a wheelchair, because there are things like going down a hill really fast that I can't do outside of having wheels on but they can do uh it's a little dangerous for them to do but um but they can see and they can kind of get an appreciation for things that they might not expect their their friend especially their friend who recently went into a wheelchair to be able to do and i think that those kinds of experiences are going to be able to drive things going forward uh in a great way is that three things or does that two that was three. That was three. Okay. I don't know how to count. <laughs> I don't know how to count either. I, I just counted zero one. So. <laughs> so I'm going to put three things out there, and then I'm going to ask you all a series of questions. I like providing roadmaps. I do a lot of um, interactive activities where I get provided a roadmap, so I feel like I've learned to appreciate that, and I hope you all do too. I'm going to ask you all a bunch of questions, and then I'm going to ask the folks on the panel to ask one another questions. I think some of us have prepared <coughs> questions for each other. And as we do that, if you do have a question from the audience, we will integrate those um, and just try to make this as interactive as possible. So feel free at that point to go ahead and start lining up at the microphone if you have a question. Um, and we will have as much of a dialogue as we can facilitate in this very, very long room. <laughs> um, so what I want to add to this conversation is, first of all, as I introduce myself, I do a lot of work with privacy, which you might wonder why I am talking about virtual reality and people with disabilities. When you interact with technology up until this point, um, there are people who need to have assistant technologies um, for their phones, for computers, etc. But with VR because and AR, because of the level of immersiveness needed and the level of data that they collect about the individual in order to have that immersiveness, no longer do you get to opt in to revealing if you have a disability or if you need some sort of assistant technology. They will know it. They will know it immediately and they will be able to either advertise to you if they want to, um, tell you where you might want to go within the virtual world or within the game. There's a lot that they can do with that. They can tell it by your eye movements, they can tell it by micro facial movements, all of the things that they are tracking and monitoring by virtue of having an environment that you can interact with will reveal to them um, not only if you have a disability, but many, many other things you might not think you're revealing as well. Um, it can reveal when you're looking at a pair of shoes that you think are pretty. It can reveal when you look at a person that you think is pretty um, and what that might mean about your sexuality, um, regardless of if you want that company to know that information or not. And again, influencing then what content you get served back by what they think they know about you. The second piece is representation with avatars. I think that uh, Meta in particular, as one of the companies that is out there um, furthest developing technology, most well known for VR and AR technologies, has done a decent amount of work to allow people to have avatars that represent who they are in the real world. So sometimes I think we assume that people with disabilities want to enter into virtual reality and leave that disability behind. But frequently, it becomes part of their identity to the extent that they say, I want to have my wheelchair in this virtual world. I want to have 
um, an avatar with a hearing device. This is who I am, and I don't like not being able to be represented in the way that I choose to be. And so giving those options to people so that they can control how they appear and um, what they either do have as features or do not have as features becomes very important to allowing people to appear as they want to and that degree of um, autonomy that we all want to operate with. And the third piece is accessibility as a feature, um, much like Evan talked about with the curb effect, when you're actually designing and building things for people with disabilities, as opposed to accessibility as a PR add-on <laughs> after the fact, where you're designing something that you think is gonna sell the product better, and then decide that it's also potentially good for people with disabilities, so you decide to market it as a tool or a feature for people with disabilities when it might not even work in those use cases um, or in real life for people who are trying to get through um, whatever feature that they're offering, um, but they've decided that they can market it in that way. And a lot of the um, features that you see at this point in VR and AR technologies added on for people with disabilities are more of that PR feature add-on at the end rather than the designed for this facet um, at the beginning. And identifying the difference becomes very important to tell if it's actually going to be useful for you or not. So those are my three. Um, I said I was gonna ask you all a bunch of questions now. So first of all, I wanna know who has used augmented reality in the room? You're not allowed to use it on the sky bridges. Just <laughs> in case you didn't see the signs. Who has used virtual reality gaming. Who has used virtual reality for not gaming? Who here, if you want to, and I am all about privacy, so do not feel like you need to raise your hand, wants to say, I am somebody who represents myself as having a disability um, when I'm using this technology. You three who raised your hands, I would very much prioritize your questions. Um, I think that they are probably the most important. So if you have them when you enter the mic, I will make sure to go to you first. Just let me know. Um, so at this point, I said I was going to let you all ask each other <laughs> questions. We now know the degree of about how many people in the audience have experienced these tools or not. Um, what do you want to know about each other? I'll ask them one more question. Yeah. Who wants to dev? VR. Who wants to develop VR titles? Excellent. Good Good turnout. All right. Excellent. Games. Who wants to do VR games? Who wants to do VR for things other than games? Excellent. All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, so, Ken and Jesse, I'll throw this to you because you have dealt with interesting uh, audiences for your products in the past. What kind of things should a developer be thinking of about UI anyway to make it more accessible to everybody? Not just focusing on classically uh, the, the folks who need extra accessibility, but for everybody. What makes it easier for the players to get into the game and use, use it the way you desire, you want them to? So I'll start with one of the things that is actually um, we, we deal with a lot of children. We deal with a lot of adults uh, in the VR space. I know you're not supposed to have kids under 13 play in VR headsets according to the ULA, but I assume that's from the privacy point of view. So we just don't hook it up no. to the internet. No? It's an addiction thing. Oh. It's well, mental we, health and addiction. I wasn't wow. sure. Well, we, we only let them play. <laughs> okay, well, we only let them play Cheers, for a, we only let them play for a minute and a half, and then we tell them to go away. And so, that first one's free, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> we, we, we we put a really strict time limit on it, so I feel like that's almost okay. Uh, <laughs> but um, height is a real big concern. Um, it's you have all the same problems you would have if you were designing a real world environment in terms of. If you have someone in there and they are three foot tall and you have someone in there and they're six feet tall and you can do something where you, you know about their head level, you can try to adjust for that. Um, but I mean, we had a game where you're supposed to crouch. Well, what does it mean to crouch? So you kind of, or jump. And so a lot of, you know, relative to body size um, motions can be taken into effect and that can adjust for height. Um, but obviously that, doesn't adjust for there's not always a linear relationship between how tall someone is and what it means to them to crouch um, and so this idea of trying to to generalize intent I think is is really different different as 
a human being, because because looking at someone, I can tell when they want to crouch, even if they're doing so very poorly. Usually, Andrew just is crouching poorly. But <laughs> you know, a computer just detecting where his head is isn't going to detect that as anything more than like a real bob. Um, that's that I think is an issue. I think I had a good answer, but you you've got me started on something. The there were a couple of points I wanted to bounce off of, but, uh, and I'll just use my time for that. Uh, she talked about um, being able to learn stuff from the process. Well, a lot of the VR systems don't have, I mean, some of them will have their own uh, initialization process or whatever. Some of them do or don't, but the game can still, wh whether the system knows that data, the game can still query it. So a lot of games, you have to initialize, right? Like, what is my arm reach? What is my height? Um, if if I if I have a disabled arm, I can't, I can't do the arm reach thing correctly, right? I, I can, as a developer, I can do a one-handed thing. I can still look at this instead of this. I can work with it, but I know how long your arms are, right? Or I have some I, some good guess. Um, I know whether you have an, a second arm or whether you choose to use it in my game anyway. Um, and the height thing is another big thing. So. In both the games that I worked on, you you were also a target, right? Um, so if I let you be three feet tall, and I and everybody's trying to sling rocks at you or something in a VR game, then you're a harder target to hit. So do I let you be three feet tall? Is this the 007 on N64 problem? Uh, I'm jump. <laughs> jump on N64. Yeah. On the well, I meant the 007 game. So. <laughs> But, you know, other than that, like, when you're in VR, things need to be as real as possible. Um, and that's what makes it an intuitive interface. Yeah. I can even throw out questions. I do, I I do have a, a comment on that as well. Um, so one thing that I, I noticed, though, while I do agree it should be as immersive as possible, I also think that, you know, like, you can sacrifice some of the immersion for accessibility. I mean, like, you obviously don't take away from the game, but add in customization. I think that's very important for developers to add as much customization as possible. Have them change the controllers, have them be able to, like, I don't want this joystick to be that, I want this to be that. Especially if you're, like, someone who's one-handed, they're going to use one controller, and they might not be able to use both controllers, so figuring out ways to configure. Um, another thing I think is very important, like, especially for, like, menu selections, what have you, is to enable the ability for the point and click of your head. I noticed there's a lot of different apps I've used and in some games where you can use your head to like point and click, um, essentially like use dual control. I think having that as like a default setting for a lot of things, obviously it's not gonna be super advanced for a lot of the super intense games, but I think having at least some kind of ability, um, especially to just have that in your game um, and have it also be uh, workable with, uh, for instance, the the pre-existing technologies like keyboard and mouse. It's very hard to find certain VR games that still accept keyboard. Um, I, For when I was trying to demo uh, using the tongue drive with virtual reality, it was very difficult for me to find that, like to find something that supports, because essentially what we do is we convert it to a Bluetooth keyboard profile and we can connect to the, the VR headset that way. Um, so what I ended up doing is I went online to a website that did WebX VR and also took in keyboard commands. So I played a game of Galaga just looking up and then I moved my tongue to the right to shoot down the the ships and it was awesome but um the the issue is is that a lot of games don't take in those inputs like like keyboard and what have you where you can do that point and click um with other input devices so i think just having um legacy devices being able to be compatible with those kinds of uh, games even though it may not be as immersive is still incredibly powerful i think that brings up another good question how is it, how easy is it to remap your interface in vr titles I've never tried to remap anything. Totally depends on the game, but yeah. Dep it depends on depends on what you're remapping, but almost every game uh, has UI remapping in it now. Um, for VR, it's so new that if you're talking about like a hand controller, and that's not there yet, but I imagine it will be. Mm -hmm. UI is user interface. If anybody oh, does yeah. it, yeah. I, I mean, there's been. The mappings have been so one to one, at least in what we've done, that the idea of remapping hasn't. We we could we could use we could use arrow keys, I guess, to drive virtual objects. But we've just been using this is where something really is um, in driving it forward. And I, I'm not. I mean, it's both easy for us to do, and it's 
kind of hard for us to, we'd have to invent a whole new input system that's in parallel to it. And while I'm not opposed to doing that work to make the game accessible to someone else, it's difficult to add to the roadmap because I don't know what it should look like. So there'd be a, it's not, it's not add a feature that is well-defined. It's a research project that hopefully arrives at a feature that someone else can use, which we don't, in, in our company, we don't have anyone who needs it or who could provide feedback as we're developing it. One question I have for all of you is, you, VR and AR in of itself is fairly new. Immersive tech is fairly new. Um, but we are on the brink of haptic feedback in immersive technologies, brain computer interfaces. These are all things that we think of, or generally people think of as sci fi, but they are around mm -hmm. the corner um, for mass marketing. Does that change anything about what we're talking about up here? Wait a second. Who's played a simulation where there was uh, pain feedback in mm -hmm. the game? Yep. A pain feedback? Yeah, motion. Mm -hmm. This is military sims do this, right? You get a zapper on you when you get hit. Why Motion would you reality. Do this, people? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds exciting. So you take it seriously when you're doing the firearms training. Yeah. Wow. It is impressive. I mean, why would you do it as a game? Is what I want to know. Like, yeah. Game, well, yeah, some like, people are interested that way. I, I mean, <laughs> it, it was affordable. I mean, it, 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 it's it's kind of similar to paintball, right? People play paintball even though it hurts. Yeah. So there's a similar kind of effect where you kind of care that you're shot. Mm -hmm. um, it's. They, at least when I played it, they had a pain dialer and they did not turn it up very high for us. <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> not for him, for me, that he's this sad that they didn't turn it up. <laughs> yeah. And we're uh, Jesse and I have done the same one. There's a, a military sim train, police training one here in town where, yeah, the, the, uh, the folks who actually train with it, they do turn it up to a real level. And maybe they like it that way, or maybe it just uh, helps them train better. Maybe it's both. But um, that feedback is definitely an important part of what they're getting. And thankfully, uh, anybody can use that, <laughs> no matter how, what their abilities. Not anybody. There are people that are pain-less abled. <laughs> it is far beyond me. <laughs> to judge anybody for choosing to do something. But I will say, I looked at the VR headset where when you die in the game, you die in real life. I <laughs> thought it might be a bridge too far. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I continue to let folks up here ask questions, I do want to once again encourage folks in the audience to come up to the microphone if you have questions. Okay. And yeah, go ahead. Um, to people um, who are um, have you know qu are quadriplegic paraplegic and whatnot um, so I was wondering in terms of like with the VR and I may have missed this I came in late I apologize has there been any ch um, a, like trying to use like um, you know like I guess eye gaze in terms like within the VR system or I know that we have a lot of people who have and I I'm new to the assistive technology realm my coworkers much more um, versed in it but i know they also use the the silver dot on the head to allow like as a pointer which we were talking you were talking about with the point and click right. system if there's any way to maybe try to integrate that into it like a vr mm -hmm. you know like a vr s headset okay was that that uh, i guess i'll take that um very good question um so i mean they definitely do have that integrated there is an option where yeah you can just have the dot and then just you can use what's called dwell control where it's like you know you can look around but then if you focus on something you'll see like a little circle and it'll wait like five seconds and it'll select something so that's something pretty standard like point and click that you can do for a lot of people who can't obviously you know, have hands or, or be able to control that technology in terms of gaze, gaze input, I actually have a research paper here for Microsoft where they essentially interviewed all these patients and had them go and use virtual reality devices. And one of them was the gaze input. And so while the gaze input does, like it is an option, um, it also does provide some caveats. Um, for instance, one of, the, one of the participants said, my first thought after using it, for about 10 minutes was that is really gimmicky. I personally wouldn't use it because I like to look around at things and, and I'd accidentally click on things or do stuff that I don't mean to do in a game space such, in a game space just because my eyeballs stray to a random corner of the screen. 
so there's things like that. Um, but then also, it's it's just like, especially with eyesight. Like I mean, I think it's again, it's a very innovative tool that helps people do things. Um, but you are restricting your greatest sensory input by having it control while simultaneously look around. So to control something while you're exploring the space with your eyes is. Uh, I would say pretty difficult, um, and uh, like there's other testimonials here of like saying like while it can work, it's 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 not great, and that's uh, where I definitely would push um, on other assistive devices such as the tongue drive or other devices. Um, it, it's kind of hard to think of other devices right now because it's all of them are pretty much catered towards uh, the screen, and there's these new ones called the Nofic earbuds which I'm not sure if any of you've heard, but it's like slight micro movements of your tongue, I mean, of your of your head, can send commands. Um, while that's cool, again, that conflicts with virtual reality as you're not, if, if you want to look over there, you don't want to do an action. Um, so, I mean, I would love to maybe get your contact info or something after and we can discuss, because, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I would love to help out in whatever way I can. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to. That's great. Well, I had two points. One, one, the eye stuff is already happening because yes. there's a technological reason they need it. They, they. Eventually, our VR headsets are going to have higher resolution where you're gazing, mm -hmm. and then lower resolution for peripherals. So they're already trying to figure out how to do they that. They do that now. They, yeah, they yeah. do. Um, it's, yeah. Per, it's impressive. It's a yeah. motion sickness thing. Yeah. Um, here's a weird, actually relevant to this panel. Women were getting disproportionately motion sick hmm. by VR devices huh. because women experience vision in a different way biologically, and they were not trained or tested on that segment of the population as users of these devices. And so when they came out on the market, they were making people sick, which is another way, reason for user interfaces to I be tested. So they now have it where you're, where you're blurred outside of where you're looking at, which actually improves the motion sickness problem. Yeah. And also, lastly, on that, they do have uh, vignettes now. I mean, well, in certain in certain applications, where essentially it doesn't blur it out, it just kind of blocks off and blacks out this part. So like, whenever I'm moving, it'll block it out, and then like if I stop, then it'll unblock it, and I can look around. But like, so that's also another alternative. Uh, something that you can do and there's actually um, there's uh, a bit, one of the big Silicon Valley um, venture capitalists uh, Paul Graham just announced uh, I think within the past week that he's um, looking to sponsor a bunch of new eye tracking companies uh, he claims it's because his friend uh, has um, a disability and needs the eye tracking keyboard and he's like these are horrible um, so hopefully there's gonna be some new money going into that space and we're gonna get some new solutions as well. Uh, one final point, though. Remember when you're when you're remapping for VR, we're used to um, key remapping. Those are binary. It's on or it off, right? We do mouse tracking. There, you know, you can use a trackball, or you can use a mouse, or you can use a arrow keys, maybe. But again, those are maybe they're proportional. Sometimes they're one dimensional. Sometimes they're two dimensional. But your VR handset is three-dimensional, mm -hmm. and that makes it very tough to have an alternate method of, of controlling it. Right. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hello. I'm Lena, and all the topics that you guys have um, spoken this far is very interesting from a personal perspective. I have used VR um, from different portions of my rehabilitation as I was fully um, body able and then there was an incident um, and it left me in a temporary quadriplegic state. So it is interesting to hear these perspectives about, as you mentioned now, with um, vestibular. And even in therapy, there have been things that I think would be extremely useful and I, I don't know if there's any technology to utilize that. So to make sure again that you get used to as someone that hasn't been moving for many years and you're starting to rehab how to get used to movements again, being in the grocery store, being in all these different sections. So I wanted to ask what kind of technologies existed for that, or if any known hospitals or institutions that you know of um, are utilizing that. As in my experience, the vestibular therapies that I've been to, they're trying, but I haven't seen any that have been applicable in that way. 
So there's a group here in Atlanta called Virtually Better, and they started by working uh, with uh, veterans suffering from PTSD, and they create a very realistic virtual environment that includes scents, et cetera, to really simulate the environments that cause that PTSD and the like. And they have expanded it out to therapy for kids, uh, for teens, and so forth for a wide variety of areas. Now, I don't know specifically uh, with your situation what they've done, but they have... I know they have used it for rehabilitation purposes as well as uh, as well as therapy. Um, that and they are in the Cab County, which is one of the reasons I know about them. Okay. Um, uh, other examples, <sighs> the sim folks we deal with will often have uh, ex-military helping them do the testing because it is training and the like. And I have seen. Uh, vets who have had various levels of disability helping them out but generally it's a motion disability but uh, they are a part of it and I think that they enjoy it as a way to continue moving and continue feeling like they can do the activities they did before I don't know how much of it is actually therapeutic but it seems to be something they enjoy that they can still do their old activities oh okay thank you and I just I guess had a one um, like a side note and I don't know if there is any information about it but I've never partaken on um, the game you guys were talking about with the pain and, <laughs> and so on and so forth, but that did actually prop uh, something in my mind that it, there is therapy that I've had to use with the electrical mm -hmm. uh, stimulation in my legs to learn how to stand here and how to begin walk. And so even though it took a while to observe people, I still, because of the accident, I lost about 20 years of memory. So uh. I don't know for example, the feeling of what is walking. Like I do have braces that pick up my feet, but the feeling of it, I think I felt it once using the electrical stimulation. And because of the shocks that it sent, it was opening you know, new neuropathways in my brain of understanding that. So um, is this something that perhaps again has been used or is there anybody else that is using it more so than just like a game, but actually to create new sense paths about areas that perhaps a person doesn't have, has lost or is in the process of rehabbing. You're a CDC guy, Evan, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not as familiar on that, but that is, honestly, that's incredible, but I, unfortunately, I don't have any okay. one, uh, Ken was talking about VR being used for exercise and, and physical health, and I know folks who do this. I also know there are folks who've used Omni games, game, the Omni is the, uh, um, the walk, in the place walk yeah, walk in place. place. It's a treadmill that's not a treadmill for VR, yeah. uh, and if you use that for the exercise point, I I would imagine that's been used for rehabilitation. I don't know that specifically, but I would think it'd be a great use. But I am curious, um, you, Jesse, didn't you program for Omni at one point? Did you incorporate an Omni into one of your titles? No, we, we never. I thought you had one at your office. I wish no, no that okay. was that was on the. The list of things that we wanted to do. No, we make people. We cleared out a uh, room scale space, and we just have people run around. Uh, <laughs> it, well, and in large part because that's the, that was to our way the easiest way to solve motion sickness. So, um, all of us, I think, I think I can speak for everyone, was feeling motion sick at the VR until we went to room scale, and then that stopped us all from feeling uh, sick. So we decided right. that was going to be the only thing we wanted to do. Because yeah, we don't like being sick personally. Kind of to build on that, I am very susceptible to motion sickness in VR. It has to be really good VR for me not to feel it. So I'm a good test person for most of the groups. But uh, one thing that will automatically get me is a change in levels. Like if you try and go upstairs, that will automatically uh, trigger motion sickness. But that is a way to virtually create stairs without you actually going up them. So I don't know if that's been an issue of walking upstairs. Yes, is it's a whole new concept of understanding. Uh, it took about maybe a year and a half to, sorry? to figure that out. The mm -hmm. muscles, what you have to engage. And, and so it's, it's interesting. But thank you for your but, time. But it's interesting that the VR, where you yeah. do change that, does mm -hmm. seem like that walking without you having to go up a level. You're doing it without it actually it. physically going mm -hmm. up a level. Yeah. I, so I, I do have one thing also with the... Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I, I believe the haptic units that were providing the feedback were based on tens so the yeah. I, which I don't know what it stands for I'm so sorry um, but that's the electrical, that electrical um, yeah. stimulation, stimulation. Yeah. So, so and I know those are already being used for rehabilitation purposes and those were actually taken from the rehabilitative space and moved more into gaming to provide feedback um, okay 
Well, yeah. thank you. I'll, I'll make sure that, you know, I follow up later with some other thoughts. But good thank luck. you for your time, well, and I appreciate you. it. Yeah, good luck with your experience with it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there, I have seen some ideas about trying to use a, a virtual mouse where the mouse doesn't exist anymore, and you're just—it's just tracking your hand instead. Is there any exploration that you guys know of of trying to do that sort of thing, but on a different? scale, like maybe your entire arm, or? So a number of games are using like a laser pointer, right? Uh, if that's what you mean. I mean specifically to uh, map a specific, so the mouse tracking would be to m map moving your finger as a button click. Um, yeah. yeah. And then you could map your entire arm, like your elbow moving as a button click or something. Uh, is that sort of thing being done? I know when you have an Oculus device, if you have as somebody who has too many, um, <laughs> you don't have to use the, they have hand recognition, so you don't have right. to use the holders anymore that look like they are something way more sci-fi. Um, and if you are using your hands, you can do things with them. Like you can make certain movements to grab things. Um, I am somebody who doesn't know how to hold a pen properly, which means I also don't know how to hold chopsticks properly. Like my hand movements are not what other people's hand movements are. So they like have you click and I'm always trying to click improperly. <laughs> so I do tend to use the controller still, but that is an option now is that they'll recognize hand motions. And what will be in the future, um, the before BCI, brain computer interfaces, it will likely be haptics where you can move like, even the hint of moving something, like small finger movements that trace up your arm um, will be able to move things around. So I think we're actually getting to the point where you don't even have to move your hand. You just have to move the muscles associated with it, think about moving it, um, and that will start moving and clicking. So, so you're using haptic in a different way that I'm used to, which is I'm used to haptic being the feedback that's provided by the system yeah. and not the micro motions of Coming your hand. Out. I might be using the wrong word. Um, it, it could it's be, the, I could yeah. be, or I could be, um, you, or there could be just two definitions that mm -hmm. are being used. Um, but they, they definitely have wearable devices as well that you can just like attach on. Um, and there, I think Meta has come out with one where you essentially have this wristband and like I can like write or something like I can just write invisibly and then I'll write in VR but they're also gonna they also have gesture recognition where if I want to move my hands in a specific way it's gonna power me up into something um, so it definitely does exist um, I haven't played around developing it yet but that being said I'm, I'm I'm 100 I can guarantee you that yes that that is existing now and I'm sure there's several games out there that have used it um, I can go and check them out for you if you want me to after this and get back to you so, sorry, and, and I wasn't trying to be pedantic. Um, the reason I say that is I find that the force feedback as I'm doing a gesture really helps. And and so the the fact that the system's telling me what I'm doing correctly, which is very easy to do with a controller and gets harder and harder as you get into more subtle motions, um, I think that's going to be a, a challenge. Um, and that's one reason I prefer a controller personally, mm -hmm. is that buzz, the vibration motor. Well, and that's why they're doing, even with phones, they're doing the, like, it's more like a button. Mm -hmm. When right. you type on your phone, right. um, it will actually have feedback. the feedback, yeah. Right. yeah. Earlier you mentioned that VR and augmented reality is evolving, is evolving in a way to be able to read or sense if someone has a disability and begin to cater advertisements and influence mm -hmm. other virtual encounters. To what extent is it being able to sense a uh, disability? Is it limited to only physical disabilities, or can it sense neurodivergence, mental illness, or learning disabilities? And what is being made to give users consent for this information getting out? Do you know it's not, it's funny is the wrong word, but I'm, it's the word I'm going to go with, <laughs> is that I next to that note point that I had, I wrote consent question <laughs> mark. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the short answer is, Yes, it is not limited to physical disabilities. It is um, any, it, it's not even limited to disabilities. It, because of how much it's tracking about what you're looking at for how long, what you do, mm -hmm. um, it can just tell neurodivergent status. 
I'm, tr- I'm like struggling at the moment to come up with things because I've actually done so much thinking recently about what it means for it to reveal your sexuality that I'm like really stuck on that because that's mm-hmm. where my policy thinking has been yeah. recently. Um, and can you, are you consenting in that phase? Um, I think that there are real questions about that. It has to collect the data. Like right. in order to work, it has to know those things. Um, and it's inferring a lot. So what is the limiting factor? Like, what can you, from a policy, legal, or technical perspective, limit to give the user back some more power and autonomy? And that's a big question in the privacy and in the um, legal space right now with this technology. Mm -hmm. Is it how they use the data? Is it how long they can keep the data? Is it what inferences they can make, if they can advertise with it? Once you get to the point where they have to collect it to some extent, you then have to look at all of the things they can do on the back end and starting to limit things to make sure there are some restrictions in place. The problem with that is we know people have consent fatigue and they don't want to go in and click like yes, yes, no for every single use case. Mm -hmm. And that's how you give people autonomy is you let them control these things. Um, So making sure that there are defaults that are user empowering on the back end so you don't have to do that Mm -hmm. is really tricky because everybody's going to want something different um, and you don't want to necessarily put too much, too many requirements on the, on the person that is, that is using the device. Oh Oh, no, I mean, it just, I'm looking at more of like insurance companies and and mm-hmm. healthcare and that coming back and getting this information and then the person ends and it ends up having more of a negative effect on the user than it provides positives. And that's a that's a long term issue with privacy is that the benefits are immediate. You give up data and you get something. There's a yeah. coffee shop in New England somewhere where you walk in and they take your data and they give you free coffee. (laughs) And that is an immediate benefit. For somebody who likes caffeine a lot, that is a very immediate, very real benefit. But the detriment is something that is in the future. It is amorphous. You don't know if you'll ever experience it. And it's it becomes a very real issue when you're somebody who talks to people about privacy all the time to get them to think through not only your own personal detriment, but the detriment caused by the environment of information being collected because the worst Um, harms and outcomes are going to be felt by those who have been historically marginalized and a lot of people who are in power and can make the decisions to actually help people are not from those communities. You're right. Um, One thing I want to add, um, at least for possible resolutions where you have people not wanting to search through the terms and conditions and Mm -hmm. all that stuff and like do everything, uh, I think especially with the advancements in AI, and I'm not sure if you've seen like ChatGPT's like custom instructions where you can now like make your own profile so you don't have to keep re- retyping in every time like, oh, I'm mm-hmm. a software developer, I need to do this. You can possibly have your own profile for like what kind of person you'd be like to accept certain privacy policies or, or terms and conditions. So it will read it for you versus you have to read it and be like, hey, there's kind of a red flag here in your profile. You've mentioned you're not into giving your data for this, but in this section, it shows you this. So I think there are ways that we can use that to mitigate and at least alert people and be like, hey, yeah, you're not going to read all this, but this section right here is going to you know, screw you over in the future if, if you're not paying attention. So Just be aware of what company the is creating the generative <laughs> AI model that you're giving your AI to in order to make privacy choices. Are they going to be able to use the data to true. see <laughs> true, true. who is the, very who's consenting to this and who's not what populations yeah. are consenting to these things very and what, good point. who's not consenting are they going to be able to take that data and then so good point so uh, yeah. one way around that is to have a local LLM which is like a local mm-hmm. language model which is not connected to the internet and therefore mm-hmm. they will not receive the data that you interact with with that uh, language model so I think there's like llama which I think you can put yeah. right into virtual reality and then they're not going to get anything so that's all your that's your personal AI that they're not going to get data on unless you grant it but there are ways there are <laughs> <Great drone. laughs> <Ways A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
you sometimes yes, sometimes no. I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer. That's a really bad answer. Is like maybe, um, but like if there's a big question now, for example, with augmented reality, where you want to be able to tag a wall, and it stays there. Like you want people to be able to see in the future. We're talking about art and um, different things, and so there are reasons why they might need to have your information over time. Um, or if somebody comes into your house and tries to tag your wall that you will want to like say this is my space and I want to claim some sort of dominion over it um, in which case there is there are reasons for persistence and then there are some times when I think it can be on device and fade away and I want to get to this question um, and before we wrap up nope no more questions we're done <laughs> <laughs> all right you can uh, you, you can uh, shock them if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I give you so I'm under the understanding that realistically it's more a sensors problem for uh, ADA compliance as opposed to a uh, UI problem. And the UI problem kind of comes once you have the sensors to utilize. So I guess I'm mostly speaking to Evan here, but anyone's welcome to chime in. So one, I'm curious how this, you said tongue drive works. Is it using an accelerometer? Mm -hmm. uh, it is? No, it, no, oh. I'm, just, I'm just nodding. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I'm curious as well, I've worked a little bit with the Walmart RFID IoT systems where they track every single item in a warehouse. Radio frequency identifier, Internet of Things, RFID yeah. IoT. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm curious how, you know, that coupled with printable electronics are being utilized for enhancing the sensor space for you know, ADA compliance and VR as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I guess to answer the question with how this works, um, so it just it uses magnet sensors. So this is a magnet. Um, it's just a small little magnet and essentially tracks the magnetic field with my mouth, reads the changes in the XYZ position, and uh, will be able to then just say, oh, your tongue moved from this position to this position. When this happens, I can calibrate it to do X or do Y. And then we're also going to add proportional control where it won't just be like, all right, it's not just gesture if I'm using it as a joystick to control an airplane, it'll be just like, as I move my tongue around, it'll like act like that joystick aspect. Um, so yeah, it tracks magnetic field and that's, and it, change, it detects changes, that's how it's able to get the position and then I can map that to Bluetooth commands. Does that require a large external module for detecting that? No, it does not. I'll, I can have a, uh, a gaming headset, or a normal gaming headset on the microphone booms, just put those sensors right on the microphone booms, that's all you need. Okay, how does it get 3D absolute so from one, it, sense, one sensor location yes so there's there's two so okay. there's on both sides you have a magnet on top bottom left and right to get all of that data and then you also have how close it is to each side and with that that's how you're able to build a 3d gotcha um and then also sorry is, are we on time? we're at time but i I'm can talk, give you 30 I'll, more I'll, seconds i'll talk wait and your 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 second part of the question was what i'm sorry again Oh, sorry, no, I, I remember. It was with the, um, uh, you said it was largely sensory versus software, and I, I'd i say I, I think I disagree. I think it's a bit of both. Um, so like with ADA, it's like you you are required by law to have like an on-ramp to buildings. Well, you should have an on-ramp to virtual spaces as well. And I think that's a merge of both sensory and software. Because while sensory can get you somewhere, um, as he said, it's not as immersive or not as efficient for it be being built without thinking of those other inputs. So I think there's also other things and aspects in terms of software, maybe in terms of UI that you can have that better adapt and make it more immersive rather than it just being like, all right, this is just for people who have two like controllers. I think that there are ways in which that you can mitigate how difficult it is for them to use even given these sensory inputs because as you said, it's very difficult to mimic a 3D controller that has all of that and everything. So ideally, they'd come up with some kind of UI, UX, some user interface to make it easier. And I'll always use colorblindness as the example. That is an important accessibility issue. If you don't take it into account, you block, you stop a certain segment of the population from using it. Every dev should have that in mind when they're dead, concepting out. 
you have all been wonderful people. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. You are things and we love you. <laughs> you are things and we love you. Um, if you weren't here for the chat GPT panel and you don't understand that, I apologize. Um, please thank your panelists. We're all going to be up here, I think, for a couple minutes at least afterwards. Mm -hmm. So corner the person you want to ask other questions to and grab one of these blue sheets with all of the panels in Scott's wonderful Electronic Frontiers track during Dragon Con um, and have fun. Yeah,